Hello everyone and good evening. Welcome to Winnipeg Center. The traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. It has been a long and exciting campaign, and we are almost at the finish line. Thousands of volunteers across the country have put in so much hard work because they believe in our plan for Winnipeg and Canada. It has been 17 years since there was a Filipino representation in Parliament, and I am running to change that. I was born and raised in the Philippines, and my family had to work very hard to establish our lives here in Canada. I am a teacher who is committed to serving, teaching, and advocating marginalized youth. When the pandemic hit our community, our liberal government were, was on every Canadian's back and no one was left behind. And as we finish the battle against COVID-19, it is now time to build forward the, the, a country that we all dreamed of. A vote for the, for the Liberal Party is a vote for $10 a day childcare. It is a vote for affordable housing. It is a vote for our healthcare sector and our seniors. And it is a vote on our journey towards reconciliation and our fight against climate change. Tomorrow, you have the hand of, you, you have the, our future in Winnipeg Center and Canada rely on your vote. And it is now time to build on our achievements that we have made over the last six years. It is my pleasure to welcome all candidates all over Manitoba here in Winnipeg Center tonight and our leader, Justin Trudeau, to take us on a, into Election Day. And now I'd like to turn it over to my friend, Dr. Doug Elfson, the Liberal candidate for Charleswood St. James Assiniboia Headingley. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Are we ready? Tomorrow, Canadians will be making a choice, an important choice. A choice between anger and hope, between ideology and evidence, between moving Canada backward and moving Canada forward. And tonight, the choice could not be clearer. We are asking Canadians to re-elect a government that brought help to families raising their children, that brought help to struggling seniors, that has lifted 118 boil water advisories in First Nations communities. That has brought over 1 million Canadians out of poverty. And that has ensured that our COVID vaccination rate is one of the best in the world. We are asking Canadians to re-elect a government that will ensure that quality childcare will be available for all families. That will work, continue its work on reconciliation with Indigenous Canadians that will protect our environment and will continue to ensure the safety of Canadians through this pandemic. I am confident that tomorrow Canadians will make the right choice. And now I am honored to introduce the man under whose watch Canada has become the envy of the world. My friend, the Right Honourable Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. What an amazing pleasure to be back here to see so many strong Liberals here in Winnipeg. Thank you guys. I want to start by thanking Paul uh, for his leadership, for stepping up, for putting his name forward and, and working very hard to be one of the very first Filipino MPs in almost 20 years in, in our parliament. But as I said last time we talked, Paul, 
there are three women who are women out there who are also running to be uh, the first Filipino MPs in uh, in four years in 20 years all of them for the Liberal Party of Canada because we continue to do the right work and Doug it is so good to see you again my friend you know Doug was extraordinarily uh, important to me uh, over this past year and a half, but as important as he was to me, because uh, we had regular conversations about what was going on uh, in the uh, Manitoba healthcare system, what was going on on the front lines of the fight against COVID, as he was stepping up as an extraordinary leader, as he always is. But as important as he was to me, he was far more important uh, to the families in Winnipeg uh, that he served through this pandemic. But if it's all right with you, I'd like to get him back to Ottawa. So let's make that happen. And the rest of this extraordinary team of candidates from across Manitoba uh, just fills me with such pride and such strength and such shared conviction that the moment we're in right now, where Canadians get to choose a progressive government that's going to continue to move us forward for everyone is upon us. Because we are very much at a crossroads right now, my friends. On est à un moment pivot, un moment charnière pour notre pays et pour notre monde. On sait qu'on fait face à des crises, des crises sanitaires avec la pandémie de COVID, une crise climatique, mais aussi des crises au niveau du logement, des crises au niveau des familles et l'abordabilité de, la, de la vie les coûts de la vie. On fait des, face à des crises euh, au niveau de la réconciliation autochtone où on a encore beaucoup plus de travail à faire. On fait face à une, un grand moment de décision sur tellement de niveaux que c'est tout à fait juste et approprié que les Canadiens puissent avoir leur mot à dire. Because right now, in this moment of pivot, this moment of big decisions being taken on how we end this pandemic, on how we build back better and fight climate change, how we continue to walk with even more ambition and urgency, the path of reconciliation with indigenous peoples across this country, how we continue to fight for families, whether it's being able to afford a new home or whether it's being able to afford $10 a day childcare right across the country. There are moments right now where we have to make that decision because these decisions, they get taken by the government you elect in the coming months. Not a year from now, not two years from now, but right now. And that's why Canadians need to weigh in on all these big issues. But even as we're thinking with optimism about how we can do even more for vulnerable peoples, how we can do even more to create good jobs and fight climate change, how we can continue to grow our economy in ways that work for everyone. We have a job to do first. We need to finish this pandemic for good. And that, my friends, is the big thing that we are starting our conversation on tonight and the big part of the big decisions that you'll be taking tomorrow as Canadians. Because we know that Canadians over the past 18 months, we stepped up for each other. We were there for each other. Neighbors supporting neighbors. Family members protecting their loved ones. Frontline grocery store clerks, frontline health workers and doctors sacrificing themselves, working incredibly long hours so all of us could be safe. That was the story of this pandemic, of Canadians being there for Canadians. And I'll tell you, from my perspective, it was absolutely inspirational. And you demonstrated what it is the very best of being Canadian. And therefore, as a government, we made a simple promise, inspired by all of you, that we would have your backs, whatever it took, as long as it took. And that's what we did. When I came out of my house every morning to talk with Canadians, I knew people were worried. I knew people were facing the unknown. People were anxious about being able to put food on the table, anxious about what their small businesses were going to do, anxious about loved ones across the country, anxious around what the future was going to look like for our kids. And we created the serve so people could stay home and stay safe. 
We created the wage subsidy and the rent subsidy and the small business account. We move forward to put supports directly into indigenous communities across the country because we knew the vulnerabilities that were there. And every step of the way, we were inspired by you. That was the story of this pandemic. You can't look at how we pulled through this pandemic and say anything, but man, it's important that we continue to be there for each other, and it's important that we follow the best advice of medical experts and scientists and researchers to get us through this. That's what everyone knows. <laughs> Except, it seems, Mr. O'Toole. We all know that the only way through this pandemic is with vaccinations. That too. <laughs> is with vaccinations. We need to make sure that everyone gets vaccinated. We're starting to see just west of us what happens when you don't get clear, strong leadership on vaccinations. And right now they're facing close downs and restrictions and real economic slowdown while people are made more vulnerable in Alberta because of political decisions. And we know that that was the wrong path to take. So we as a government, as a federal government, are showing the kind of leadership that is needed. We're focusing on the almost 80% of Manitobans and Canadians who chose to do the right things during this pandemic, who stayed home, who put on their masks, who washed their hands 25 times a day, and who chose to get vaccinated. And right now, we are leading the world on populations of people who are double vaxxed because Canadians stepped up. And my job as Prime Minister and our job as a world now and as a society is to make sure that we're helping you get back to the things you love to do as quickly as possible. If you have stepped up and done the right thing for your community, for elders, for those frontline health workers who continue to be overwhelmed by cases of unvaccinated people ending up in hospitals, of putting little kids who can't get vaccinated at risk, our focus is on getting you through this, and that's why we've been unequivocal that in the coming months, if you want to get on a plane or a train, you need to be fully vaccinated. If you want to work for the federal public service, you need to be vaccinated. If your province decides to do the right thing and move forward on vaccine passports so that you can go to a restaurant, to a beautiful open air patio, to a gym, uh, to a movie theater in safety and know that your kids aren't going to be exposed, we will foot the bill for those vaccine passports to make sure that they happen. It's obvious to everyone that just as Canadians were there for each other, we should be there to support the people who've stood up and been there for each other. And yet that's not what Aaron O'Toole is doing. We know vaccinations are the way through this pandemic, and he, who wants to lead the country, can't even lead his own party and make sure that all of them get vaccinated. Shame on him. And it is enough to make you scratch your head and say, wh wh why? Why is he not saying what every other party is saying? That no, if you're going to be a politician, if you're going to lead your community, you should lead by example and you should be keeping people safe. Not incidentally, like one of his candidates, not being fully vaccinated and still going to visit seniors' homes. That's just not right. But why is he doing this? Why is he not insisting on the basic thing that he's saying for all Canadians, because he said that he wants all Canadians, or 90% of Canadians, to get vaccinated, but he won't even force 90% of his caucus to get vaccinated. Why is that? It's because he 
is worried about the anti-vaxxers in his caucus, and he wants to hold them together. He wants to pander to the anti-vaxxers in his team, which is why even those of his candidates who have done the right thing and got vaccinated, he's asking them to hide the fact that they were vaccinated from Canadians. It makes absolutely no sense. And that approach is not only not going to serve Canadians who've done the right things. It's picking the rights of those who are putting you and your families at risk over your rights and your freedoms to get back to the things you love safely as quickly as possible. So that is the choice that we are making and that is the choice you get to vote on tomorrow. How do we move forward through this pandemic? How do we end it once and for all? Will you have a government that shows that kind of leadership that Canadians after this year deserve? Absolutely, when we choose forward. But one of the things that you hear Mr. O'Toole talking about all the time is, no, 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 he's going to focus on the economy. Well, he's already demonstrated in two big ways that I just talked about, that he doesn't understand how to grow a strong economy. The first one is that he was criticizing us for having given too much help to Canadians, too much help to workers, too much help to small businesses through the beginning of the pandemic, not understanding that the way to actually ensure that our economy comes roaring back fastest was to allow families and communities not just to lick the COVID crisis by being able to stay home and not have to go to work to be able to put food on the table, but also to be able to hold on in our small business. I don't think I've been into a restaurant in the past three months where someone didn't come up to me and say, thank you for the wage subsidy. Thank you for helping us through. It was tough but we were able to hang on. We were able to make it through, and now we're coming roaring back. That's what Mr. O'Toole doesn't understand about the economy and about Canadians. And more than just being the nice thing to do or the right thing to do to make sure we were supporting Canadians, it was also the smart thing to do for our economy because we have now recovered 95% of the jobs we lost during the pandemic compared to the US that has only recovered 76%. Investing in Canadians is always the right investment and Mr. O'Toole doesn't understand that. He still thinks that trickle-down theory of giving tax breaks to the wealthiest and hoping it ends up in, in uh, everyone else's pockets is the way to grow the economy. Well, it's not. And we demonstrated that back in 2015 when the first thing we did was raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could lower them for the middle class. And then we delivered a Canada Child Benefit that put hundreds of dollars every month into the pockets of families tax-free that needed it for their kids. And we were able not just to create a million jobs over the past number of years, but see a million Canadians lifted out of poverty at the same time. So Mr. O'Toole doesn't understand that it's investing in Canadians and their health and safety and well-being that keeps us growing our economy. And he also doesn't understand that vaccinations is the best way not just to keep us safe, but to ensure our economy comes back as quickly and as strongly as possible. That's two strikes on Mr. O'Toole. The next one, the next one that we continue to see is even as he talks about needing uh, to support Canadians recovering from this pandemic, he doesn't understand that $10 a day childcare is the path forward for this country. <laughs> Provinces right across the country have gotten that, have signed on to $10 a day childcare within five years, cutting childcare fees in half 
within the next year and creating about 250,000 spaces across the country once we've signed with all provinces. That is the path we need, not just to take care of our kids, not just to give families uh, more money in their pockets for mortgages, for groceries, for activities, because we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars saved every year by average families. But it's also a necessary step to grow the economy, to get women back into the workforce after a recession that has hit them harder, to give moms choices. And again, he doesn't understand that. And again, we see him pandering to special interests within his party, whether it's the anti-vaxxers I just talked about, whether it's the anti-choice crowd, where no matter how much he pretends he's a pro-choice leader, he can't be a pro-choice leader because he doesn't lead his own party. 80 people voted against a woman's right to choose in the last parliament. That's not leadership. That's not what Canadians deserve. He panders to the gun lobby. He made a secret deal with them back when he was running for the leadership that he would restore, render legal again, the very same 1,500 models of assault weapons, military-style assault weapons, that we banned over a year ago in this country. He wants to bring back guns that were not, not hunting rifles or shotguns, guns that are military-style that were specifically designed to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time. Even most conservatives don't agree with that, but he's in the pocket of the butt gun lobby, so he got himself into a really, really big pickle in this in this election trying to explain how he could want to bring that when Canadians know we need stronger gun control not weaker <laughs> one of the areas that I know here in Blue Note Park we have to talk about is arts and culture and how Winnipeg is such a center of vibrant culture and creativity and art and we need to make sure we continue to invest in arts and culture and not fall back on the Stephen Harper conservative ways of cutting arts and culture, of cutting anyone who dares dream big or criticize a government. That is ridiculous. We need to continue to stand up for our identity, our culture, and our future. That's something the Liberal government will always do. And on reconciliation, Mr. O'Toole hasn't been anywhere on that. We have done an awful lot of work in walking the road of reconciliation together, but I am the first to say there is lots more to do. So let us do it together. Let us stay focused on the better future we can bring. When we took office, there were 105 long-term boil water advisories. We have now lifted 118 of them across the country, and we have a concrete plan and funding and a project team to end all of them in the coming year. We know that there is more to do, but I will tell you, that there are tens of thousands of indigenous kids across this country who started this school year in brand new classrooms, in new and refurbished schools right across the country because of investments that we made. And I am incredibly proud to be joined here by such strong indigenous leaders I look forward to coming to see uh, as we come around, but also to be joined by 25 indigenous candidates across this country who've said, yes, we need to be part of the government. We need to be part of building a better future for all of us, and that's what we'll do. And finally, Mr. O'Toole can't pretend he has a plan for the economy and jobs of the future if he doesn't have a plan to fight climate change, which he doesn't. We have put forward, as a Liberal Party, the most ambitious, forward-looking, and concrete plan to fight climate change this country has ever seen. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can look at what we're doing, whether it's putting an absolute cap 
on oil, oil, oil and gas emissions and reducing them to net zero, whether it's moving towards a net zero electricity grid or ensuring that by, 2020, by 2035, 100 percent of new vehicles in this country will be zero emission vehicles. This is the plan to protect our land and oceans, to move forward on banning plastics, and it's an ambitious, ambitious plan. And we all know that we have to keep moving forward. And Mr. O'Toole's plan is to actually not just do less or lack ambition on climate change, he's actually going to bring back our targets. Maybe that's what he means by take Canada back. He's going to take back our targets to what they were under Stephen Harper, even though we are already on track to strongly surpassing all those targets with the hard work we've done right across the country on a price on pollution, on protecting our oceans and coasts, on banning single-use plastics, on protecting more of our land than ever before. These are the things we've done. This is what we need to continue doing. Mais sur les changements climatiques, je sais que vous savez très bien, faut pas juste écouter les politiciens. Il faut écouter les experts, les économistes, les climatologues, les scientifiques qui étudient profondément les changements climatiques et qui nous disent, oui, ça nous prend plus d'ambition, ça nous prend plus de travail, ça nous prend plus de solutions concrètes. And that's exactly what we did. We listened to scientists, we listened to climatologists, we listened to economists who are looking at the green economy, and we put forward the most ambitious plan of any of the parties here. Just to give you a little snapshot, not only were we endorsed as the party with the best plan he'd ever seen to fight climate change by the Green Party of BC leader, Andrew Weaver, but one of the top climate economists in the country, Mark Jacquard, rated and ranked all the different climate plans the Liberal Party got an 8 out of 10, only an 8, but better is always possible, which is by far the strongest plan. And the NDP plan to fight climate change got a 2 out of 10. All the experts are unanimous that our plan is way stronger and more ambitious and more real than the NDP. And that is something that Canadians can feel good about. Because I know we've reached this point in the campaign where there's a lot of progressive Canadians saying, oh, I know this is the time we have to make a tough decision because I know I don't want a conservative government that's going to take us back in a thousand different ways from climate change to women's rights to guns uh, to child care uh, to ending this pandemic and investing in science. I know as a progressive Canadian, you don't want any of those things. And you realize, once again, we're in the situation where only a liberal government can prevent the conservatives from forming government. But I know it still bugs a lot of progressives because they say, you know, I know that I have to vote Liberal to stop the Conservatives from winning. But on the other hand, I really want to vote for the party that's going to be there for families with the greatest ambition. The party that's going to be there on reconciliation even stronger than ever before. The party that's going to push us all to do more on fighting climate change. People say, on the one hand, I need to vote for the Liberals, but on the other hand, I want the most ambitious, progressive representative in my riding. The thing is, in this election, both of those options are the Liberal Party of Canada. <laughs> Everywhere in this country, the Liberal on your ballot is committed to the most ambitious plan to fight climate change, the most real and tangible plan to invest 
tens of thousands of dollars to help families save up for a new home and invest $4 billion in municipalities to confront the housing crisis. Every single Liberal candidate is unequivocal on standing up for a women's right to choose. Every single Liberal candidate is unequivocal about strengthening gun control. Every single Liberal candidate is vaccinated and willing to do whatever it takes to end this pandemic for good. So my friends, le choix que nous avons à faire demain est très simple. Nous pouvons choisir de revenir en arrière avec les conservateurs ou nous pouvons choisir d'avancer ensemble. The choice we get to make tomorrow, my friends, is clear is an opportunity to say yes to child care, yes to reconciliation, yes to stepping up on the fight against climate change further than any government in Canada has ever gone, and yes to ending this pandemic for good. This is the choice we have, and I know tomorrow Canadians are going to choose to move forward for everyone. Merci tout le monde.